Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to another Ask the Trainer Live. My name's Ellie and today I'm joined by Noseman and in the background we have Darren and Sassy answering your questions and the guy who's making all of this technically possible, um, Hashi. How, how's everyone doing? How are you guys doing? It's nice to be here with you. I hope you're all good. Always nice uh, to be in uh, the best company. <laughs> Always a pleasure. So over the last few weeks, the team have been covering a bunch of Cinema 4D certification topics uh, over these Ask the Trainer sessions. So we've looked at refractive materials and nested dielectrics. We then looked at some rigging fundamentals. And today we're going to be diving into uh, probably my favourite topic, which is no surprise, and that's MoGraph. But before I hand it over to Noseman himself, if you did want to catch up on any of the previous Ask the Trainer sessions or any of the sessions that the guys have been running, then you can head over to our Max One Training Team YouTube channel and just check out either the Ask the Trainers that are coming up or any of the other things that have been going on. We like to record as many of our sessions as possible and post them on there for you guys to catch up with. And then if you want to find out anything that the team are running, so all the shows, all the great shows and sessions or webinars that the whole team are doing over the next few weeks, then all you have to do is head over to the maxon.net events page. And then you can see all that, all the wonderful stuff that's coming up from hands-on sessions to Ask the Trainers to VFX and Chill, uh, Demystifying Post-Production and Maxon Colour. We have so much, so much going on, so much content coming to you guys that, you know, we're just super happy to be doing that. And um, yeah, we can't wait just to bring that you guys so don't forget there is a chat section in uh, the YouTube live and so drop your questions in there and we'll answer those as best as we can so as I said you know we've got Darren we've got Sassy in that questions area I'll be there and we can of course ask Noseman himself because um, you know he knows all so and don't forget you can always contact us on socials YouTube comments and training at maxon.net um, so we can be we can be there to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can so Without taking any more of your time, Noseman, uh, what are we going to be learning today? What are we going to be getting into? Well, uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, or good evening, <clears throat> depending where you are. So today we're going to talk about MoGraph. And I think I need to press a button here and do this. And uh, yes, can we confirm that everything is working on that side? No one's confirming, but anyway. Yes, it looks like it. Everything is working. So we're going to talk about MoGraph. And uh, the way we're going to cover it today uh, has to do with the fundamentals. Because uh, MoGraph is uh, extremely powerful. And um, it's a tool where you can do all sorts of things from animation, procedural animation, modeling, uh, uh, and all sorts of other things. So uh, we are going to cover uh, the, the mechanisms by which MoGraph works uh how it sets things up and uh the reason i'm doing this is there are tutorials on how to use mograph uh, specific uh ways to implement it and, and do various things what doesn't really exist is um the uh, the deep technical dives what what's happening behind the scenes and the reason i like to um focus on the technical aspects of uh, every tool is that by knowing how something works and uh, sort of bounding the, the knowing the boundaries of uh, a tool or uh, a technology it allows you to find better ways to solve potential problems and it saves a lot of time when you know that you can do something or you can't do something and you have to find other ways and um, a lot of what we're going to say today pretty much everything is knowledge you need to uh, to have uh, in order to solve the exercises and pass the test, um, uh, specifically for the MoGraph part. So, uh, without further ado, <clears throat> let me, um, I have this uh, little uh, illustrator file here. I try to make it as uh, pretty as uh, possible. And uh, we're going to talk about the MoGraph generators and quickly what they do. Uh, what data is associated, uh, and there are two types of data within MoGraph. And uh, I want to make uh, the disclaimer is that these are generalizations. 
All right, we're not going to go into the uh, every every uh, bit of information, but these are generalizations you need uh, to be aware of. So, uh, MoGraph data or Mo data, um, we have the generated, the ones that are generated by the MoGraph generators, and uh, the accessed. So, if uh, an object that's being cloned uh, has some of uh, these parameters then MoGraph can access them and, and uh, modify them or change them or do things with them. Then we have the two MoGraph uh, modifiers. And uh, uh, here I forgot to change this. So real uh, time, um, you're watching me uh, change my presentation. Excellent. I mean, uh, that's, uh, whoops, wrong buttons. I still haven't... Uh, figured out the control command difference between PC and Mac. So, uh, and I was saying, and the effectors. So let's uh, take this from right from the beginning. Um, the MoGraph generators is uh, the cloner, the matrix, the fracture, the Voronoi fracture, the Mo instance, and the Mo spline. And the Mo spline, there's a slight little uh, question mark. Um, it's not... Uh, um, uh, 100% a MoGraph generator, but uh, yet uh, it is. So it, it, it veers into other areas. So we won't cover it uh, extensively. Well, we won't cover anything extensively. Now, in terms of the Mo data, um, I'm going to take a step back and explain what MoGraph does. MoGraph is a deterministic particle system. Uh, what we name, uh, what we call a clone is literally a particle or a node, depending on what context you're, uh, you're reading in, in the uh, documentation, it may be referred to as a MoGraph node. And for each generated of these instances, these particles, these clones, um, the MoGraph generates a unique index number, an ID. We're going to see them in, in Cinema 4D very, uh, very soon. Uh, it generates a transform matrix, uh, a color for each clone, which is basically just the display color uh, we find in the attributes. Uh, it adds a, a weight, which is a normalized value from zero to one uh, for each and every one of the, the clones. Uh, it adds a UVW. Now, don't confuse this with uh, our usual polygon UVWs. This is just a way to identify uh, wh where within the bounding volume of uh, a cloner uh, an object exists. So um, from the, let's say, well, let's, we're going to see it in Cinema 4D, but it, it's a UVW. Again, it's normalized each and every one of these parameters, U, V, and W. I think it's for X, Y, and Z. It can have a value from 0 to 1 to indicate if it's closer to the minus X or plus X, minus uh, Y, plus Y, minus Z, plus Z. And it's normalized from 0 to 1 for each and every one of these. The other thing is the offset. Uh, which is used in the blend and the sort. And basically, it's the position in the hierarchy that uh, a clone exists underneath a generator. And uh, it's always a number from zero to one. So it's normalized. And I'm putting in the terminology so uh, there's a common language. Um, when we talk about technical aspects, it's good to use um, some sort of uh, terminology. And then we have the visibility, which is uh, it's not associated to the object visibility like uh, in editor and in renderer. It's um, if a particle is going to be generated or not. And then the access, the object we are cloning, um, they if it has keyframes, uh, then the MoGraph generator can access the values within those keyframes. Uh, I put keyframes here in parentheses because it doesn't work with procedural animation. So only keyframe data. Then it can access the hierarchies. So we can create um, uh, clones that are complex hierarchies, and uh, MoGraph can access those hierarchies and, and do various things. Uh, the attributes of each object, uh, that is data that a MoGraph is aware of. And finally, topology. So uh, if we have two objects that have uh, the same number of uh, points, uh, but the objects look different, just like the morph, uh, MoGraph can access the um, uh, position of each uh, point and create all sorts of effects amongst them. Now, the two modifiers, the MoExtrude and the Poly effects, allow us to use MoGraph to consider uh, polygons of an object as uh, clones. So uh, we get uh, indexes and transform matrices and all that, but not everything, but a lot of this can be changed. And we're going to see a couple of examples. And finally, we have the effectors which pretty much allow us to modify 
some or all of the parameters that are generated or accessed. And we're not going to talk about fields. Fields is a totally different uh, aspect. It's just a way to mask uh, effectors. It's just three-dimensional masks. So uh, if there are no pressing questions at this uh, moment, I'm going to switch to Cinema 4D. And that's the, the wrong button. Uh, we did actually have a quick question yes, about inside effectors someone was asking about the modify clone parameter but it mm -hmm. wasn't listed in that list uh, is it a type of data or yeah it's a, a part of an effector so if you add an effector any effector and you go here in the parameters it's a modify clone now the modify clone this one here the modify clone pertains to let me bring up this to the um, uh, offset this is what the modify clone does it accesses this parameter the blending sorting. I have some examples already built for you, uh, which I'm going to show you shortly. But basically, that's what the modify modify clone is not a parameter. It's how we access the offset uh, of an object. And when we say offset, it's not a spatial offset. Offset. It's a um, hierarchy offset. So let me very quickly just to clarify this issue. If I have a null and three cubes underneath, the offset is this is object zero. This is object one. This is object two. So uh, depending on how many objects we have, we can have any number of objects. And uh, three, it's here, over there. There you go. So in this particular case, um, the first object will be at offset zero. The last object will be at offset one. So we need to, these intermediate spaces here uh, should be 33 apart. So the value to show this one would be zero. The valid show this one will be 33.333%, uh, 66.666 for this, and 100 for this, or oh, 99.9999. According to uh, some mathematicians, 99.9999 in infinity is actually equal to 10, and uh, there's a way to prove it. It's uh, intuitively wrong, but it's the fun with math that can bend your mind. Start watching math tutorials uh, and the videos. They're quite interesting. So, uh, but adding all numbers uh, uh, to infinity does not equal minus 1 over 12, right? That is a fallacy, uh, if anyone knows what I'm talking about. So, basically, this is what the offset does. It, it, it gives a number where the first one is a 0. You can have, uh, you know, any number of objects underneath here. The first one's going to be 0%. The last one's going to be 100%. And you divide with um, uh, the, the count minus 1, so the in-between in steps. And uh, that's how you access things. So that's the modify clone, uh, essentially. And if you want okay, to, thanks. yeah, and one of the examples I'm going to show, uh, these are very simple examples, um, it will actually allow you to do your learning MoGraph, how to assess certain things. So first of all, let's go and do an overview of the MoGraph uh, generators, uh, what they do, and, and so forth. So uh, let me create a new scene, empty new scene in our standard interface. And let's go and just dock this out here so we, we have it. Um, I'm not going to start with the clone. I'm going to start with the matrix. Now, fun fact about the matrix, and by the way, this doesn't render. We know that. Um, the matrix creates any of the, the grids we have here, any types of these, so the grid, the radial, honeycomb, linear, and so forth. But what does it create? So that, that's a good question. Have you ever made a matrix object editable? So I'm going to press C here. And basically, it disappears. So most people will say, oh, uh, bummer. If you go to point mode, what happens is that it creates four points per object. One lies at the exact center of the axes of where a clone would be. And the other ones are now distanced uh, one unit, one centimeter away from that. One in the X. So this one is one in the X. And if you want to make sure this is the, the fact, you select them both, you open this and you see it's X uh, size is 1. Uh, then we have the Y. So now we're going to have Y1. And uh, the Z is this one. And basically, this was um, uh, an ingenious way to encode uh, a matrix. Uh, and basically, what a matrix is, uh, what you see here is a matrix. right? It's um, a mathematical way to compact position, scale, and rotation uh, data. Internally, it's not stored this way. It's stored using a little, um, let's say, half cube, 
with these four points where each point has a position. And only by moving around these three little points, uh, we can define the position scale and rotation of an object, funny enough. So I uh, suggest you go and uh, look up certain things about matrices. So uh, internally, a matrix generator is a point object. That's what we need to remember. Uh, the, the matrix object was created specifically to solve the following problem. So let me go and uh, frame my default here. Somewhere around here it says frame default. There you go. So the cloner creates actual physical copies of whatever we put as a child. And I'm going to add my typical uh, little cube here. So 20, 20, 20. I'm going to make it a child. Then we all know that we get whatever the configuration of the cloner is and the number and steps and, and all that kind of stuff. So if I take this cloner and I'm, I'm, I'm showing you the cloner to show you why the matrix was generated, I'm going to put it under a null and I'm going to go and add to this a bend deformer. Uh, when I do this, what happens, I'm going to just turn it around here and let's go and add some bending. What you will see is that the cubes bend. You can see the geometry here is uh, changing and I can go to my cube and add a few segments uh, just so you can see that it's bending, right? It, it's obvious that it's bending. So the matrix object was created because the bend deformer is bending the generated geometry. The matrix object was created so that if we want to bend the matrices and then clone our cubes on the matrix that we wouldn't get and I'm going to make this 10 by 10 as it were as it was before and just make the same parameters here oh, I don't remember what that was grid uh, 200 by 200 by 203 there we go so 200 uh, endpoint 200 by 200 by 200 and three, three and three. And now you can see that, right, let's go here and set this back to object. There we go. So now we've bent the matrix, but the geometry is not bent. So the only reason the matrix was ever created to begin with was to disassociate using deformers on matrices or using deformers on the generated geometry. So this uh, uh, very small distinction suddenly uh, created a, a huge number of opportunities uh, to, to use the matrix. But its original conception was just this, to be able to, to deform, to use deformers with, um, with matrices. And uh, the encoding into points was um, um, a great way uh, to do that. So that's what the matrix does. Now we can use it in any uh, in different contexts, and we can generate thinking particles and all sorts of other stuff. But that that is that was added functionality, um, where there was an opportunity to make it even more powerful once it it met its original goal. So um, I think um, I'm done for the matrix. Um, any questions? So I can move on. Anything that this um, uh, raised? Any questions? Nothing at the moment. No. Good. Okay. You're, you're giving us all of the information, so we Excellent. couldn't possibly have any questions. Excellent. Are people watching it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so let's go to um, the cloner, uh, which is a bit more uh, interesting as an object. And uh, let's talk, uh, talk about the data it, it generates. So I'm going to uh, get, again, my little uh, 20 by 20 by 20 cube. And um, we know that it, we have all these modes, uh, linear, radial, grid, and honeycomb. And let's stick to the transform, because the transform informs us of a bunch of these parameters we have here. So let me, so uh, index, transform, color, weight, um, the, the UVW, offset, visibility, and so forth, um, are evident uh, when we go here. If you go to the transform, you will see that it, it will display nothing, so just the, the clones. But you can say, I want to see the weights. And uh, by definition, the way the cloner works, and this relates to a question um, that uh, something that was discussed uh, recently in uh, uh, some of the the, cir the circles I I frequent. Uh, the question was, uh, can we apply just through the deform uh, th through the generator uh, a variable w variable weights or variable colors or or variable uh, position scales or rotations? And the answer is no. So one of the fundamentals of MoGraph is that we set an initial state 
And if we want to start modifying these and sculpting the state of whatever we're, we're building here, we do that using the effectors. So uh, a cloner can only assign, so let's go here and do index. So each and every one of these clones has a unique index. That's it. And it's generated the way um, the, the, these are generated internally. So this is the first one, the second one, the third one, and so forth. And it's what we call a zero-based array. It starts at zero, and the last number is the total count minus one. So for mathematical reasons. Now, um, the, the we cannot tell this to generate IDs in a different configuration uh, unless we just change the, the mode. But again, they're going to be ascending. We can't, there's no way to tell the cloner to say, I want this to be index zero. I want this to be index one. I want this to be index two, three, and so forth. That is a job of an effector if we were to do that. With indices is a bit um, odd, but uh, nonetheless for everything else. Um, even the color. We can generate colors for these, but these colors are going to be uniform across all clones. So the initial state of uh, the MoGraph uh, cloner is to create a uh, uniform uh, set of uh, clones. So we can't make them become bigger when we're cloning a single object. Uh, we would do that using an effector or a blend effect and so forth. Uh, moving forward, UV. Uh, this will uh, provide us, and um, this will be an interesting thing to, to see it here. If I had uh, 5 and 5 and 5, and let's just bring them closer. So talking about the, the UVs. Now, this, this here is creating a bounding box, uh, a three-dimensional bounding volume, as we call. So these UVW coordinates can allow us to identify all the clones which reside on the extreme, let's say, minus Z, uh, the ones that reside on the extreme plus Z, the extreme plus y and the extreme minus y, and the, for the x, the same thing. So regardless of how large or small this volume is going to be, the UV coordinate of each and every one of these clones is going to be identical. So that's why you see the colors are not changing here. If I, if I zoom in here, you will see that this blue color, which is just a combination of um, red, green, and blue colors, right? Um, so as you can see, the, the blue is uh, maximum for the plus x and minimum for the minus x and so forth. So regardless of how big or small this is, that's always blue. So it's UV position within this, UVW position within this bounding box. And that's why you need to emphasize on the W. It's a third dimension. This is a three-dimensional uh, normalized uh, position uh, uh, based attribute. So uh, this is very useful if you're doing things like procedural buildings where you want to identify the edges this edge here would have a maximum of the U, for example. I, I, at this point, off the top of my head, I don't know if U is X, uh, V is Y, and W is Z, something like that. But this line of clones over here has the unique UV position that they have the maximum U, for example, if U is the, the X, and has the minimum Z if Z is, uh, sorry, W if uh, uh, Z is the, the W. So by using logical operations and a bit of uh, Python, and I think I demonstrated that, you can identify the corner parts of your building or the bottom parts of your building or the, the top parts and uh, so forth. So UVW uh, attributes are very useful to identify edge cases or to say that something is not an edge case, so it's it, in, internal uh, inside a, um, a volume that we're generating. So that's the usefulness of UVW coordinates. So let's move, uh, go to transform again. And uh, then we have the color, we saw that. And then of course the weighting, we saw that. And let's change this to, uh, we have color, we have weight, none or index. Now in terms of um, time, this will only work if there is a time uh, uh, attribute, which is again, it's an accessed attribute. So you, we need to have keyframes so that MoGraph can access the, the time uh, parameter. And there are various modes, uh, play will play normally, loop will uh, play normally. Fixed and fixed loop allows, it, it surrenders control of these, not to the cloner, but to the effectors. And again, you will find tutorials that explain exactly how that works. I can make a, a quick example. If I start moving faster, 
uh, with this. So these are the uh, attributes. Uh, let's see what is uh, not visible. So let's go to the hierarchy thing and, and check this out. And I'm going to sort of tie it with uh, the um, uh, blending. Let me see. I think I had a blend. Do I have a blend here? Blending. There we go. So here's a, an interesting little experiment you could do with with the blending here. And I've set up this uh, scene for you. And basically, I have a cloner set to iterate mode. Here it is, iterate mode. And it has three objects underneath, uh, text 0, 1, and 2, so that we can identify it here. We have cloner blending over here. So it's in blend mode, and it has 0 and 1. We have cloner sorting here, and it has these five uh, clones. And uh, this is for the uh, cloner sorting. So let's begin with the iterate. The iterate mode just goes through the uh, position in the hierarchy and puts them in order. So 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. They're all linear, by the way. And it repeats this forever. The clone blending, as I said, uh, I've, I've done a, the following trick here. I put in the text here 0, and I put in the text here 1. And one of the things that... Um, a cloner can do when we have text splines, uh, providing you don't have any extra uh, carriage returns or any other symbols in here. It actually reads the, the numerical data and can uh, blend uh, between the numerical data itself. So here you see an example that the first one is always zero, the last one is always one, and the intermediate ones are going to be the, the fraction of uh, where uh, that will be generated. So if I take this cloner blending and increase the number, you see that uh, the, the percentage of the uh, generated hierarchy they rely on. But it's always the last one is 1 and the first one is uh, 0. So that's why we get these funny numbers. And I did a tutorial how to create random numbers or counters and stuff like that. It's on Cineversity, so go search uh, and you will find. So the sorting itself... Uh, allows you, and by the way, um, the when, when you're just doing a simple blend, you don't need to do anything. But if you want to control the blending using a, uh, a cloner, you just need to set the parameter to modify clone. So now it's modifying everything. Uh, but this one is set to sort mode. It's not blending mode. It's set to sort mode. And basically, it allows you to use a cloner to um, dictate which one of these numbers is going to be available. So let me turn off my, I'm going to remove my linear field from here. And you can see the last one is four, all right? They're all fours because the modified clones are 100%. The, as I bring this down, I'm actually picking from the hierarchy offset. And uh, at zero, it's going to pick the first one. As this goes up, it's going to pick the, uh, the second one. So number one, as it goes up, the other one, the other one, the other one. And because uh, we can mask this using a field, uh, we can just go and, and uh, modify this through a mask, a linear field. And now we're using a field to change the numbers. So again, another nice little nifty trick where you can create counters and countdowns and bombs exploding and all that. I leave the bombs exploding to, to hashy and uh, I'll leave the numbers to you. Okay, so... Uh, that those are the fundamental differences and uh, how the the uh, blending and how that relates to the offset uh, which is used in the blend and uh, sort. Um, the other thing I want to show is the visibility. So somewhere around here, I had a matrix. Uh, that's not it. Mo extrude, mo instance, mo spline. Yeah, I think I didn't save it. So the uh, visibility. By the way. Uh, one thing, again, for you to test certain things before you uh, understand how things uh, work is that when you generate a MoGraph setup, um, you can make it editable to see exactly what, um, it's, uh, what it's doing, right? So if I say I want this, uh, I want this to be my original setup, and I want to go, let's say, and add in here a an effector. Let's say a step effector. And the step effector is set to uh, scaling mode, right? So it's scaling up. Uh, if you're wondering what this is doing, um, all you have to do is make this editable. So I'm going to press C to make this editable. I can get rid of the step. What you see is that although all the cubes seem to be the same, the scaling is saved in the scale parameter. So this way you get to understand that MoGraph doesn't change the topology of an object. It just changes the actual uh, scale um, parameter of, of your object. And you can do the same thing if you want 
to do something like color, for example. So let's do a final one here. I'm going to add a plane effector. And in the fields, I'm going to add a linear fuel. You can see now what's going on here. And maybe I'm going to go here and add some uh, rotation as well. Just add some rotation. Make this editable. You can get rid of that. And now you will see the question is, where is the color stored? Well, the color is stored in here. There you go. So each um, and every one of the clones, um, the the attribute is not some sort of hidden MoGraph attribute. It's hit, it, It's actually baked into the um, display color of the object. So understanding these little things is going to help you uh, comprehend the mechanisms of MoGraph a bit more. So, and feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So let's see where, where we are. Oh, the hierarchy bit, that's what I was trying to say. So let's go here and create a very um, simple hierarchy so you understand how uh, this works with, with a simple um, setup. So I'm going to go to the Y, bring these up and make this uh, 20, 220 and make this uh, linear. It's always nice to simplify things. Uh, set this so that it creates clones over here. Good. So I have one cube that's cloned. I'm going to take now a... Uh, bend to former, make it 25, 201, and 20, 21, 201, 21, because I like things to be like this. And there you go. I have this bend. I'm going to take the same thing, put it here, and bend it the opposite way. And I'm going to set this to blend mode. So what it's doing now, it's reading the hierarchy. And I'm going to space these out. It's reading not only the cube, which are identical in this particular case, it doesn't need to be identical. It can read parameters from the object itself, and it can read parameters from its children. I don't know if there's a limit how deep this can go. I leave it to you uh, as homework to create a, a nested uh, hierarchy um, uh, that is uh, very, very deep and see um, if this breaks. But one crucial thing, if you change the hierarchy, it's broken now. Because I have a null here now. The hierarchies are not the same. So it will use this and this, and it can't... MoGraph does not know that these hierarchies are... Uh, let's say they're identical, essentially. But no, because there's a null here, it, it doesn't allow the hierarchy to, to work. That's why when a third or a fourth object that doesn't uh, conform to this uh, hierarchy is added, that object is going to be added um, on its own. So maybe I had another cube here without a bend. And let's see if this is going to work if I make this uh, taller. So you can see the common parameters of, of this work to a certain extent extent. You can see that the, the attributes are um, blended across the whole hierarchy, but not the stuff that's not common. So these are um, ways for you to figure out exactly how MoGraph works. Excellent. So let's uh, go back to my thing here. Now, <clears throat> let's talk about the other generators uh, very, very quickly. And um, before you get yes, into please. that, we've had quite an interesting question from, I think it's um, Bavana. Mm -hmm. It says, good morning, Team Maxon. I'd like to take a 10 by 10 grid of cubes and use an effector to make them appear one at a time. And from what I believe, it's then consecutively. So yep. row one, you'd go zero to nine, then 10 to 19. Yep. How could you use clones and effectors to achieve that result? Okay, let's... Um... Uh, that's a good question because um, it will allow us to use some effectors as well. So here's my general setup here. I'm going to set uh, this to be 20 by 20 by 20 or a bit more, 25 by 25 by 25. And let's uh, increase these. Uh, let's make this 15 by 15. There you go. So I want these to appear um, one by one. Uh, if you want things to appear in order, then you use a step effect. So let's go to the step and uh, let's tell the step not to scale, but to make it uh, visible. So now I can increase or decrease the number of the step effector. Now this has sort of a, a threshold of 50% because the on or off state is um, a binary state okay it's either on or off there there are no um uh, intermediates it's either on or if it's uh, or off so uh, you can use this spline to do this if you wish to do that so you can use this oh come on not that there we go let's let's try that by animating this you can just bring them in that's just 
one of the ways you can use just by changing these two parameters. There are ways to do this using fields uh, as well by accumulating on top of their uh, indices. But depending on what you're trying to do, the step and approach using a step effector, because a step effector takes the indices as the, um, let's say, the, the value of uh, interest, and you can apply the, the visibility. Now, if you want them to be a bit more, uh, let's put this to zero, or minus one, sorry, that will be, uh, you can use the step effector in, in an equivalent way to make them uh, disappear or appear, as you can see. So there you go. That's the best way to do it. Look at that. Just animate this uh, spline to make them bigger or smaller. Or I think we would be able to do that using the visibility as well. Let's see if that's going to work. So there you go. Boop, 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 boop. And let's see if I do this. There you go. And you continue with it. So you don't have to touch the strength just by animating the spline itself. And again, there's. it seems a bit odd why we have to do these two motions, but don't forget that visibility is a state uh, that's either on or off. It doesn't have any intermediates. And uh, the way uh, the, the values here are that um, if you divide the indices from the first being, uh, let's say, zero to the last being one, uh, the middle is 0.5. And there the effector says, well, anything that's less than 0.5 disappears. Everything that's above 0.5 appears. So that's why we have to do this little thing in the doodle here. But this this would be the approach. And I hope the question was uh, um, answered. Yes, it was. You got a thanks in the chat. So oh. thank you so much for answering that. And thanks so much for that question. I thought that was a really cool one. Thank you very much. So um, what was I showing here? And uh, yeah, as I told you, Ellie, um, I, I really like losing my train of thought. <laughs> okay, so Sorry. Let, yeah, no, 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 please. Uh, it, it's better to address people. Now, let's talk about two other important things, which is the fracture object. So the fracture object, and I think I have a scene for the right click here. I think there you go for the fracture. And basically what I have here is a bunch of uh, objects. Let me turn off um, my in this. Right. So I just have a bunch of objects. I have an extrude object called object one, object two, object uh, three, object four is a hierarchy with two cubes and object six is a sphere. So we just have random objects. If I want to affect these objects using MoGraph, the first thing I need to do is bring the objects in the MoGraph context. We need to make uh, MoGraph aware of these objects. Now, one way would be to create a cloner, put them underneath, and then just make a linear and spread them out and so forth. But maybe you just want MoGraph to immediately just read them. So that's where the fracture object comes into play. The fracture object is um, a, a, surrogate ob a surrogate object. It allows you to read hierarchies and uh, or single objects and uh, bring them within the MoGraph context. So when I turn this on, suddenly each one of these things is considered a clone and we can add effectors to it. And it can apply all these uh, variables as you can see them. Now the modes it has and uh, is a straight where basically what I've done here, I went to the uh, the fracture, I added the plane effector. The plane effector is moving things on the X and I've added a field that's animated. So what we're seeing here is the uh, fracture object in uh, straight mode. In straight mode, it will treat each object individually, right? That's what it does. So each and every one of the objects, even the hierarchy, this hierarchy is a single object. And you can see this if you set this in the transform to index. So you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It only reads four objects, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So that's the straight mode. If you change this to explode segments, then look what's going to happen. It takes everything that is not a polygon island and breaks it in single object. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Even the, the little dot of the eye is a separate object now. So now we're going to have a different effect. We, you can see that everything is moving independently. Now, the last mode, which a lot of people still do do this, it was added because in previous years, the extrude will create caps that were detached from the object. We don't have that anymore. 
So uh, the only reason this was added was that if you had explode segments, the, t the caps would be considered separate. But since now generators create um, uh, caps and, and uh, the, the uh, extrusion as a single object, uh, this is not uh, very much used. Uh, and I, I haven't found a case where it's still um, where it's uh, still helpful, but it still exists for legacy reasons. But this is how you use the fracture object. It's to bring arbitrary hierarchies within the MoGraph context and then treat either each uh, hierarchical level or each object or each polygon island as a separate object. It has some minor limitations in the way it works and, and all that. It places an axis in the center of each object. And again, I think that if I make this editable, I'm going to get a better idea of what it does. You can see that it creates a polygon object out of each and every one of them, if, uh, including all their uh, selections for for uh, the caps and the uh, one, two, three, and so forth, roundings and uh, edge selections and anything that's available in the extrude generator, right? So and do many, many times, if you go to extrude generator, go to selections, th these are all um, available to um, each object. So that's what the fracture does. Now, any questions on the fracture? Nothing? Anyone? Bueller? No, Good. not I can say. Good. Uh, very quickly, the Voronoi fracture. The Voronoi fracture is extremely simplistic in, in the way it um, in the way it works. So I instead of Voronoi fracture, I added a fracture object. Don't do that. Uh, Voronoi fracture and fracture. There you go. So basically, what this does, it creates a Voronoi uh, split of an object. So it's a particular algorithm to create these um, weird shapes here. Um, using whatever uh, sources and whatnot, but uh, that's um, not important right now. Uh, the great thing about it is that it, it is um, a MoGraph generator, which immediately after it uh, creates all these uh, fragments, it creates from each and every one a clone. Okay, and this was just the way it was uh, designed, and th that's uh, the the idea. Uh, MoGraph is not necessary for this to exist. It could have been just an, uh, a generator that splits objects in in bits. But the integration with MoGraph was um, a fantastic uh, addition because it allows you now to do whatever you can do to MoGraph objects for each and every one of these. And uh, just as a little side thing, you can drag in here anything you want, including uh, particles. So let's just do that. Maybe we can crash in MR4D. It's fun. It's always fun. But there you go. That's just fun. You do that. You look at it. Everyone thinks you're working very hard. Like, how did you do this? Well, it took me a while. So that's the, the Voronoi fracture. Let's go back to my notes. Um, now, Mo instance, the most Keith blind. Keith Oh, yes, please, Darren. I have a possible gotch us question. Yep. What if we're cloning a rigged character? Uh, that's, that's not um, MoGraph's problem. It's the rigged um, character's problem. There are ways to use MoGraph to create quasi-crowd simulations. Um, but I, in but what I would advise is, uh, if you're using procedural animation, so joints are um, applied to objects as deformers and all that, it will become a mess. So if you, the best thing would be to bake uh, things as alembic uh, or uh, point caches, and then bring them in MoGraph as um, objects that have their animation and uh, allow them to to be um, to populate a scene. Um, I don't remember, have I done a tutorial about how you can blend? It is available somewhere out there. I don't remember if I've uh, done it on my YouTube channel, on Cineversity, where you can take um, an identical object, which is an Alembic, and you can use MoGraph's blend mode to blend between the time um, the time parameter of the Alembic. And you can create, uh, using three or four characters, some sort of quasi-crowd uh, simulation. And if you combine that with some colors and uh, whatnot, you can actually create the illusion of uh, randomness. But uh, yeah, I, my ad um, advice is that bake things, if you have um, a lot of animation, uh, and if you want MoGraph to control things, you do need keyframes or you do need some sort of um, fixed animation. So to an extent, you can do it. Thank you. You're very welcome, Darren. So back to my um, my memory thing. Okay, Mo instance and, and Mo spline. So the Mo instance, which is somewhere here, it not many people use it, but it's it's fun to use. So what I have here is a clone. Uh, sorry, a cone. I have a cone. 
and you take a mo instance and i'm just going to remove these uh, for for now uh, and actually why don't i just i've got a clone i said clone again i have a cone right can someone uh, edit out the l so i have a, a cone and i'm going to create a mo instance now what happens with the mo instance i don't i can just reset this um you just make it a child of the mo instance and uh, you you say what history depth you have and you press play well that's interesting why do i have two of these okay great let's do this again in a new scene and if it doesn't work i don't care um a pyramid a mo instance make it a child, make it smaller, good. And now if you start animating the mo instance, what it will do, it will record the transforms and all this data for each and every one of the frames. So the simplest way to do that is go and add a vibrate tag and just let's expand this and make it a bit smaller and press play. And that's what it does. It just creates copies based on the position of uh, each uh, frame, the matrix of each frame. I can add rotation here, and it's going to do this. So uh, the good thing about it is that it's a MoGraph object. So if you have an ind you have the indices, you have all these things here, you can increase the number of history, uh, the history depth. Uh, you can make this. But don't forget, the animation needs to be on the Mo instance itself. So uh, I can make this a bit faster and move it a bit more extremely right there you go that was a bit too extreme the great thing is that because each and every one of these has an index it's a mograph cloner you can go and add something like a step effector and that, that's uh, sort of the uh, best way to do it and you're actually as you can see we're, we're creating a situation where these are growing and you can create a sort of a, a blocky graphics like a fire if you if you're moving upwards and things getting bigger or something like that you can create trails uh, things that seem to be you know a a fake um, a motion blur using many of these you can make them fade out and, and so forth but nonetheless um you can do interesting things uh, doing that as you can see in a very very simple way i mean this alone is worth its money so uh yeah so these are the generators, um, basically, um, the, the, the generators. Now, people sometimes say, oh, and the, and the Mo spline, which generates on, on a spline to create text on circular paths and, and so forth. Now, I'm not going to, uh, because we're running out of time. Oh, my God, time flies. I'm 56 years, yeah, 56 years old this year. So um, the one. Tough. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the tracer. Uh, oh, I'm going to talk about the MoSpline as well. The tracer itself, although it's part of the MoGraph toolset, it's not a MoGraph uh, object. It was just developed um, at the same time frame uh, and can be used with MoGraph to do certain things, but it's not a uh, MoGraph object. It doesn't have the, the transform and all that. So now let's talk about very quickly about the Mo spline. The Mo spline is something like a ma matrix object. And... Um, the best way to view what, what it does is to create a matrix object, set the matrix object to object, uh, drag the most spline in here, and go and set the distribution to vertices. That's it. So now the most spline, when you start changing uh, things, so let's go to simple, you can extend it, you can have fewer uh, points. Each and every one of these things, imagine being a point on a spline. So... The Mo spline is a spline which is created by connecting uh, points, like matrices, essentially, and that can be affected by effectors and forces. So these are just things that have been uh, added. So you can just uh, move everything up and you can say, I'm going to make a linear field and set it on the plus Z. And So basically, it's like a matrix object, but what it constructs internally is a spline. Now, one of the things I love about the, the most spline, it, it has various uh, methods. So uh, we're not going to talk about turtle and L systems. That's a totally different thing. We have simple and spline. So simple means it's generating, it's auto-generating those little uh, point positions by itself. I'm just going to bring this up again so we can see them. Um, so it's doing it by itself. 
And here we have all the parameters. We can spin this around, we can curl it around, we can raise it up. So there are so many things we can do, create uh, interesting uh, spline shapes and or point ordered, um, ordered points. You can use this to clone things on, so it makes it uh, extremely powerful. What I love about the most spline is that we can actually export the most spline data into an actual spline. So just make any spline, make it editable and tell the most spline to feed this to a destination spline. I'm going to just turn everything off here. And this spline here, which can be used in any spline context, is basically now um, affected by how the most spline works. And the fact that we can use effectors and all sorts of other things just makes this whole setup very powerful. And because now this is normal spline, I can go and even change the, the type of... Uh, uh, of interpolation it has and uh, the points it has and you know bezier and b spline and, and all that so the the more you start looking into most spline again without even touching the l system the, the turtle it's uh, super powerful uh, you can remap splines you you can um, take a spline with fewer points and uh, resample it to more points and do all sorts of other things and um, yeah just be aware that if you're using the forces um, uh, and the, the most spline is more sensitive than uh, a, a, a spline dynamic simulation, for example. Good. So any questions on this? So we can move forward? No, nothing on that, but getting lots of lovely positive comments. So oh. it's going great Thank stuff. You. Yeah, just uh, yeah, keep it going, right? I don't <laughs> want the laziness when it comes to uh, compliments, right? Don't be cheap with your compliments. Uh, that's what feeds me basically and um okay back I, have, to I have a question yes please Dan. uh this is this is uh, my own question um i've not tried this and i'm wondering if 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 uh you have can we can we use that uv data in redshift if that is not shading data that's positional data it just called UVW because UVW is a system that has normalized spatial dimensions. That's the only reason. So we can use it in we can use it in uh, Redshift if Redshift supports the uh, UV MoGraph UVW uh, user data. Uh, that is something I need to look into, um, and I don't want to start Redshift right now because uh, yesterday, two days ago, Redshift. Uh, I think I updated the drive. Big, don't update your drivers if your computer is stable, right? Never, never. If, it, if, <laughs> if anything, if Cinema 4D says update your drivers and yet your system is still stable, just don't do it, right? Defy authority. And uh, yeah, I think I updated to a new, I, I'm, not, I'm not good with PCs. I don't know. Awesome. Uh, I say yes, yes, yes. And the answer is no, no, no. Thank so, you, Thanasis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can we can discuss this. And generally, what I would like to advise everyone is um, hit anyone from the Maxon team on on Twitter. I'm at NosemanGR, uh, Noseman the Greek. So NosemanGR, ask your questions publicly. Uh, you will get a lot of engagement, and um, uh, the majority of times uh, we will spend some time in finding various solutions. Just frame your questions uh, very very carefully. Uh, so, um, Darren, hit me on Twitter. <laughs> Will do. <laughs> we'll talk about it after the show. So, because it's an interesting thing. But I think that data is uh, available to us. If not, I'm just going to think about it for a moment. Okay. Back to the cheat sheet. So, these are generally the, the generators. Um, let's uh, take a quick look at the Mo Extrude and the, the Poly um, effects, which I find them to be um, quite interesting. So this is just a procedural animation I've uh, created. I have a tutorial in university which shows how to create a fading of an object. And basically, the the poly effects allows us to, and and the uh, Mo extrude allow us to treat polygons of an object as if uh, they are clones. So my my not octahedron, icosahedron, right? My favorite type of. Uh, of uh, solid. So uh, I'm going to leave it as it is uh, right now. And I'm going to go and say, OK, let's get um, poly effects. And it's a modifier, right? It's purple. It's a uh, sort of a deformer. And uh, basically, what you're telling it is to, to split up your object into clones. Each clone is basically a uh, polygon. It doesn't give you indices and all that. I think it's because it takes a long time to draw them just to save us the trouble. But you can see what it does if you go to the effectors. 
and you add an effector. So the, the poly effects internally splits up every individual polygon and makes it a, uh, a clone. And then, just like you can do with clones uh, when you're using uh, MoGraph generators, you can access the usual parameters of each and every one of them. And this is great because it allows you to create some interesting, um, let's say, dissolving effects or something like that. So a nice little thing you can do is go here and say, okay, let's go and add a random effector. We have this nice little randomness, and I'm going to add sort of a turbulence here. So this kind of goes like that. Lovely animation speed, 50%. Nice. And you can change the positions. So do that. So they only go outwards. Then we can change the scaling and make it uh, uniform and do that. Good. So you can see that you can create these effects. And then you can say, you know, I want to animate this and make it happen. So you have this going whoop, 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 and you just move your field through and the, the sphere attaches itself. So the fact that you can take a polygon object and make each individual polygon the equivalent of a clone and then treat it like any other clone, that is the, the power of the poly effects. It, in a similar way, what you can do with the... Mo extrude is again it treats each polygon as a clone but it adds some extra functionality to it so it will take let's put this to one and let's go to transform basically what transform does here it i'm going to make this half so what this just did is it takes every polygon it creates one extrusion and to that extrusion it applies a uh, a, a 50% a 0.5 uh, scaling and this happens for each consecutive one and it moves it by five I can extend this and I can say you know I'm gonna keep this at uh, Z I think I keep it at one so the distance grows so you can control these and now you're creating sort of a C urchin now the great thing with the Mo extrude is that it complies to effectors and it has two modes so if I take a plane effector and set this to Z because that's the the direction, uh, the outward direction. So the Mo um, extrude uh, has from root and per step. And basically, do I have the poly effects Mo extrude somewhere here? Do, 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 Mo extrude, there you go. I have a quick example here. So uh, I've got a linear field that's coming through, that's coming through, and you can see that when I apply a step effector, and this is set to per step, <clears throat> it will apply the minimum uh, scaling because this is set to scale. Uh, let me get rid of my uh, field. So this is set to scale, right? It will apply the <clears throat> minimum, no scaling here. And each polygon is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and get to the maximum, which is uh, minus 0.88. Whereas if I set this to from root, it will treat all of them in, in the same uh, sort of uh, manner, uh, all the, uh, the steps. So if I go and add more steps, this should start making them smaller. Let's go step. There's my uniform scale. There you go. So the, the two modes is that from root will actually take each step and apply whatever transform we have, whereas in uh, the... Uh, uh, per step, it will actually take each polygon from its original position and apply it. Anyway, uh, th that's the, the distinction. But again, it starts by treating each polygon as a separate clone and then applying some sort of transformation to that. So it's um, uh, quite interesting, uh, the, some procedural setups you can, uh, you can create. And uh, yeah, you can use the effectors to create. If you take that nice little sea urchin I, I did somewhere at, around... Um, this and uh, you add a random effector to this and uh, you set uh, this to <clears throat> let's go zero zero oh, i'm gonna, actually going to do it with scale and go with scale and you can make uh, this scale this scale there you go that one or that one which one should i go for like that i'm just going to do something silly turbulence and now you have a nice little turbulent thing and Again, you can change the amount by uh, how much this extrudes and you can take another effector and you can change that and you can set this to 
an extra 100 and then you can add a field. Now we have a field that controls, you know, you can make sort of exploding stars and stuff like that. But the, the fact that you can treat uh, components, polygons, as uh, clones is where the pile, uh, power lies with our two um, MoGraph uh, modifiers, this one and this one. Are we good to go over? Is that part of our tradition? Absolutely, we can go over because we've actually had a really uh, cool question from Chris on yes. the things you've just been showing. Yeah. He was wondering, is there a way to kind of clump polygons together so that you're not necessarily affecting individual polygons, but more like uh, them as a group or a series of polygons? That would be something you would do with the uh, fracture object and uh, creating your the the groups. <clears throat> so right, let's try something. That's actually a very interesting thing we can do. Right, let's let's go and see uh, how we can do some sort of procedural setup. Well, you know, we're just uh, spitballing here. So icosahedron, and there we go. And let's let's say we have all this, and and we want to create some sort of weird pattern thing uh, going on. Now, number one, before we do any of that, you could use a Voronoi fracture in hull only mode, and this doesn't create internal things, and then just go and use um, MoGraph on, on this, right? So here you go. Number one, solution number one. So you use a Voronoi fracture to do that. Now, if you want to go with uh, objects, with um, uh, polygon groups, okay, let's try that. Now, first of all, we need to split this up in very particular uh, ways. Let's see if we can do this using a poly effects modifier and let's go in here first of all let me see all right i'm gonna make this 0 0.9 0 0.9 0 0.9 so i'm splitting up these polygons right so you can see clearly i'm splitting them up now if i take this and use a random field in this with a uh, noise so let's go and make this big oh poly effects Oops, I didn't put a, I need to put a, an effector. So, uh, all right, now, so again, one, 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 wrong. Poly effects is going to split this up. I want to split it up using a plane effector. So let's get the plane effector and let's set this to scale and let's make it uniform scale and make it smaller. So I've got the same effect through an effector now. Excellent. Because if I put things in the fields here, it's just how um, if I'm allowing the poly effects to work on certain areas. So it's masking it. I don't want to do that. I want to control the effect. So we're sp the reason I'm splitting them up is because then I'm going to use a connect object to connect the groups back. So in this plane effector, I'm going to add a random field. So let's add a random field. There we go. And uh, I'm going to make my noise either bigger or smaller let's see what we're going to do here i'm going to go closer and i'm going to use let's go here to the parameter so i want to do something where these are not affected so i'm going to go to the random field the remapping and see if i can make this i want what i'm trying to do is use a randomness to keep some of these polygons attached to each other and for some reason I can't seem to be able to do that mm, let me think why would that be if this random field is set to that and in my view settings we we'll see I'm gonna make this a bit uh, sharper using my my remapping. I love to use the curve and then reset it and then use these values to make it a bit sharper, something like this. So I have identifiable uh, groups here. Now, if I take this and put it under a connect object, I have no idea if this is going to work, but why not try? I'm going to make sure weld is on and I'm going to increase the tolerance. You can see polygons are starting to get welded together so we got the detached parts and we got the attached parts and then this connect object now i want to use it in the context of a mograph object so i'm going to bring it into a 
fracture object. And because these are polygon islands, I don't, do I need to, yeah, I'm going to go to explode segments. In theory, bah, 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 okay, in theory, I can now use some sort of randomness or plane effector or something like that to split these apart. As you can see now, the groups are retained. Now, instead of a random effector in the random field, you can actually use things like a map. Imagine if you have a map of the globe and you map it on the sphere and you can make each country sort of um, um, appear on its own. And you, you can use that as well because this is just a, a random field, but you can use other things as well. So this would be a procedural method of uh, doing this and uh, retaining these polygons. Another way would be if you wanted to um, just make sure that the sphere itself was editable and you had polygons sort of, um, you know, you select various polygon groups here and you can split these out. I love to do a command X and then a command V. So now these are split, as you can see here. So now we have these objects, you put it under the fracture object, and there you go. So that will be the manual way of doing it. But th there are ways of doing it, as, as you can see. Um, yeah. Did that answer the question? Praises. Yes, I, I think so. Yeah, it was great, great answer. Yeah, Chris has said um, brilliant in the chat, so I'd say so. Yep, uh, thank you. Now, I'm pretty sure this could be done to a certain extent if we use the poly effects. And I'm undoing now. I'm pressing Command-Z, which is a very interesting way of doing things. I'm pretty sure there could be a way of doing this using some sort of uh, field. I think so. I mean, I'm not even, I'm not absolutely convinced. But anyway, anyway, uh, the, 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 the overall sort of, uh, the, the overall idea uh, would be to split them apart and reconnect them together or do it manually. Good. Um, so did anyone ask about Python? Do you have a question about Python? Oh, did we? What's the question about Python? I, uh, I just uh, saw a, a comment here in our local chat. Uh, any, let me see. Darren, do you know uh, what that question was? Oh, by any I chance? Was I was actually going to, I was actually going to say sassy, probably numbers. That was a while ago. Tell okay. Us, sorry. Anyway, just uh, as, a, so uh, let me see what I have on my list. So we showed all this. Now I'm not going to talk about the uh, effectors uh, that much. The, the way to, to approach it is uh, just go systematically through all the uh, effectors and of course use your, your help. Um, but essentially the uh, effectors modify uh, the the mode data that's available um, at any given moment. That's what they do. And just to make sure that we understand um, the the overall generalization, uh, number one in the effector tab, we have the overall uh, strength of the effector. The effector is um, right. The the w w I have the tutorials on Cineversity that talk about fields and how fields can uh, fields. Uh, setup workflow can be comparable to an After Effects setup where you have your base image, uh, your footage. On top of your footage, you put an adjustment layer with all your effects. So effectors will be the, the, the effects you put on the adjustment layer. And the fields is basically a mask layer, which you use that to mask the effects. That is the, the trifecta of, of using effectors, uh, generators, effectors, and, and fields. Now, overall, Whatever we set in here, the parameters, this, these parameters here is what's going to be changed or applied to whatever MoGraph generates, regardless of how it's generated within the MoGraph context, matrix, cloner, um, Voronoi fracture, fracture, whatever, it doesn't matter. The effector that's applied to our MoGraph object is going to modify whatever is available. And different uh, effectors have different aspects they can assign. For example, the uh, delay effector can only change position, can only affect position scale and rotation, and you can't change the parameters. It just creates a bouncy, springy, or blendy effect between any of these three, or all three, or whatever is selected. So 
each effector is informing you as to where its limits are and what it's uh, supposed to do. So let's go quickly to the plane effector, which contains pretty much everything. The one exception is the target effector, which is much more powerful than most people realize. So we have the position data. So this position data is going to change whatever this was. And by the way, you can always go and create an initial placement for everything and offset things over here. Many times people say, oh, they're facing the wrong way. Well, go and rotate them if they're facing the wrong way. I mean, why are you complaining? So uh, the effector will take whatever this value is and based on its strength, it will apply it. So in this particular case, what we're doing here, if I take a cube that is 100 by 100 by, all right, this is 200, so that means that from the center upwards, it's 100. So the matrix is generated at zero. The plane effector is pushing everything upwards by 100, obviously. The cube is 200, therefore half of it is 100. And this is the maximum value that the effector is applying. But I can go and tell this, please apply 50% of your value. Please apply 25% of your value. So the, with the overall strength, you're actually, this is sort of a transparency of uh, the overall effect uh, of uh, whatever the, the plane effector is doing. Then you have minimum and maximum values. These are clamps, uh, basically. So you can tell it the maximum is 200%. And uh, internally, you sort of multiply these uh, two times one. So 100% is one. One times one equals one. One times 100 equals 100. Therefore, the cubes are moving, the matrices are moving 100 upwards. Two times one is two. Two times 100 is 200. Therefore, these are moved up 200. That's a simple um, way to think about it. And then you say, from this final value, let's now start changing the way uh, the, the, the effect is applied. So let's add a, a linear field. And there is. So this is just masking the values after the multiplication. So on this side, we're going to have zero times whatever we got from all these multiplications. So it's zero. On that side of the, play, of the um, linear field, let's go here. On this other linear field, we have one times two times one times 100 is 200. The, 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 internally, that's what's going on. Uh, so these are all, even fields are sort of multipliers to a certain extent. They just the masking is basically multiplying by uh, a number from zero to one. So uh, I was trying to make a point here, which I totally, totally uh, forgot now, but oh, the effectors, right. So these are all the values you can go and you can uh, change. The color, um, the weight uh, transform, if you have weighting, I'm going to say one thing about weights in a second, the U transform or the V transform, so you can sort of transpose uh, things in, in, in space. Uh, the modify clone, which is the offset, the time offset, and, and the visibility. So um, very quickly, just in case people miss it, these are things that are good to know. Back in the good old days before fields, we actually had a specific uh, function for effectors that allowed us to uh, create uh, the, the weight, to use the weighting uh, to change the way an effector is applied. Nonetheless, the most important thing to understand about fields is the following and uh, weights. I'm going to create a plane effector. I want this plane effector to only affect the weight transform. I'm going to go here and turn on the weights. And in this, I'm going to add a linear field. So what I'm doing now is I'm using a gradient to define the weighting value from 0 to 1 of each and every one of these clones. Now, if I'm in a, any any weird setup, I'm just going to make this invisible. For, oh, no, I don't want to make it invisible. Anyway, if for any reason I want to use the weights now, just the weights, in another MoGraph uh, setup, let's go to another matrix, and let's set this to uh, 20 by 20 by 20. Let's move this over here. Good. Let's uh, tell this uh, new matrix to uh, move stuff upwards. Excellent. But I want these things to move based on the weighting values that we have over here. How do we do that? Well, when you drag a MoGraph object into your field list, it asks you 
is this a point object or is this a MoGraph object? This is a secret. If you say MoGraph object, what we're bringing in is only the weights. This brought in these values here. If I move this bugger now this way, it should start affecting. It's not affecting, but why? Oh, yeah. Why is it not affecting? Oh, because they're all red. I need to move everything. There you go. So the, yeah, because if I move uh, this, the field, you know, th these are becoming yellow. Look at that. Red here, yellow that way. But if I move them all, I'm bringing everything in. So basically, this is what I'm doing. So if you want to bring weights in from uh, one MoGraph context into another, all you have to do is select that MoGraph object. Okay. So I think we've, uh, I've exceeded um, the limits of the certification and all that. But, you know, the more you know about these things, the essence of these sort of tutorials and, and presentations is that by exposing you to what you don't know, it allows you to uh, increase your knowledge and your curiosity and uh, open your, your minds to possible solutions for problems you didn't know how to solve in the past. And... Uh, just to reiterate the certification uh, thing, it's mostly to test your ability to use the Cinema 4D tools at a basic level to solve uh, common problems. That's the whole idea of this whole thing. So the more you understand how the actual tools work and the inner workings of the tools, this will allow you, when you're in the process of solving problems, to uh, know which way you're going to going um, uh, going to go. I've seen many artists struggling to solve problems because they didn't know that a certain thing does a certain uh, operation. And if you don't know those things, there, there's no way for you to know what you don't know. Right? That that is one of those interesting things. And one of the things we're trying to do in these sessions is to highlight certain things you may not have known, so that you start investigating them and acquiring knowledge uh throughout that so do we have any other questions here how is MoGraph with emitter uh, what emitter standard particle emitter i have a tutorial on how to fill bottles with vases um sorry bottles with vases oh my god <laughs> i need more coffee how to fill vases and bottles with pills and stuff like that using dynamics uh it exists on university um yeah just create a a standard particle emitter, uh, create um, any you sort of... the title of that? I'll, I'll find that link. Well, that's a very good question, Dan. I, I have no track it down. recollection. So set the emitter, get the matrix. Let's turn everything off. Tell them this to generate on an object and just tell the object to be this emitter. And now the emitter is generating matrices. That's how you do it. And if it's a proper cloner, you add dynamics tag and everything goes down. Uh, any other questions? Did anyone catch any um, any other question? Is everyone still there? Uh, yes, <laughs> we are still here. There was a couple of other questions. Um, wow. Hit me. So there was one from someone saying, um, could you use vertex maps as a group? So, you know, when we we're talking the previous question, when we we're talking about, you know, grouping polygons together, could you use a vertex map? Uh, in that sense, to create a patch of polygons? That would be possible. Uh, yeah, because, so, uh, because we could use that method to scale polygons, uh, that can be anything you want. It could be an image, it can be a vertex map, and so forth. Let me see if it was in this file. Let me see which, did I do this somewhere here? No, I think it was here. If I do 150,000 undos, I may get back to that original state. Uh, or I can always recreate it. No, I created a new scene. So let's uh, quickly see if and how that could be possible in the same uh, vein, because a hedron, and I always like to, this is my my uh, standard thing. We want vertex maps, so I make it editable. We go to tools and pin tool. There you go. And let's make the smaller, and let's go and do whoop, 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 whoop. And woo, woo, woo. so we have three identifi uh, identifiable groups. So now what we want to do is scale things. So go here and get the poly effects, drag it in here. And what I want to do to this, so we have poly effects, poly segments, fantastic. Go here 
and let's add a plane effector and this plane effector i wanted to scale things so scale and uniform scale and make them smaller but i want to mask it using this thing so that's that answers your question now because all these are attached uh, and of course i can go and make it sharper I, I can do all sorts of things because in here i can go and add a curve modifier and i want to tighten it up this is just like uh, reset so those bezier handles go so basically i can do something like this i think um, i i drew very broad stroke so i'm not going to bother with that but now we have these identifiable groups and everything in between if you make a smaller line or if you instead of using your paintbrush you do edge selections and just set them you know something best thing to do is do it so there we go sphere edge selection is there's one selection let's go command shift i'm pressing command and shift and click to create these uh sort of selections here i'm going to just do this there you go and then i'm going to press control and point i've got all these points and i'm going to go and say um store selection oops what am i doing set uh vertex weight at a hundred percent there you go so i should have this good now i can go here and drag this in the not in this field in the plane effectors field so just drag it on top to make sure it updates and there you go we broke these up because they're broken up uh i don't know if these are attached or something like that but in theory i could now uh put this under a fracture object and tell it to um be uh, d use the explode segments method and then go here and add a random effector and there you go so you can see that you can do this oh my god i just did an exploding planet i'm a genius good <clears throat> did oh i found that tutorial oh. that you did thanasis oh excellent thank you so much darren mm -hmm. yeah to use emitters the proper way to use particles to uh create uh, dynamic uh, particle clones. Do not put a dynamics tag on an emitter when it's emitting things. It will work to a certain extent, but you don't have so much control. Just put it through a MoGraph object, use the MoGraph in object mode, and put the emitter in there. It could be think of particles groups. It, you know, the power is, you know, it, it's amazing what you can do when you start doing these things. So watch those tutorials and uh, you can, yeah, you can thank me. Uh, I'll, I'll hear it in the ether. Other questions? Motex is also a generator. Yeah, it, it was removed. Uh, that's a very good, it was moved here. So text, which was called Motex. And uh, basically, the, the great thing about the old Motex, now text, is that you can assign effectors to either or, so you can go here and add or everything is one object or you can assign it to um, each uh, to lines, to words or to letters. So let's go. Uh, I'm going to deselect it, go and add a plane effector to the letters and then go to this plane effector and add a linear field. And I'm going to do this. So letters or delete words drag it in here i need more than one word so let's go and add more than one words word 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 there you go so now you will see that this goes by word and so forth you understand the the, the rest so this is it's amazing what you can do with text uh, if you understand that we can have uh, lines text letters and all sorts of interesting things you're very welcome thank you any other question? Um, someone asked about Python. Right. I'm going to put in five more minutes. I'm not going to show exactly, unless there's another question which is closer to what we're trying to show, because now I'm just showboating. So, you know, you know me. Any questions? Um, I, no, I think, I think you've got through pretty much all of them, as have the guys in the comments as well. But yeah, the Python one was the only one that we uh, didn't really get around to. Let's let's quickly. Uh, I'm I'm not going to show you how to do Python coding. I'm going to show you that what the Python code uh, means basically. Now, 
number one, let's go here and do a Python, Python, Python effect over here. And uh, the Python effect itself has uh, two discrete modes. It has the parameter control, which basically allows you to add some sort of a weighting to each and every one of the parameters, right? That's what it does. You use Python to define uh, per clone what happens w w when you change the values. That's why you see this little code. Um, th the value that this code returns um, is what will be assigned here. So I think, so what I'm going to do here, just for the fun of it, right, just for anyone that wants to get started with this, and if I break it, um, just forget that I told you this. So I'm just going to return one. If I return 0 0.5, execute, that's it. So whatever the Python returns is basically the strength, and it's going to be multiplied by the parameters and all that uh, stuff. This is what this code does. If you can write three lines of code that tells you to get the position of this and m multiply it by the a value and export this value, it, it will go and, and use sort of a create a step effect. Now, the other mode we have here is the full control. When I say full control, you lose the parameters and the code, the, the sample code changes. That's because in the, in the parameter control, again, we just return the strength per clone or for the whole thing and, and so forth. But in the full control, now we can control the parameters. So everything that's a part of the mode data uh, set, uh, matrix and all the nice little stuff here, indices and all that, now you have full control over them. Uh, so it becomes a bit more complex, but uh, there's um, uh, enormous power into that. I mean, uh, I'm proud to say that I managed to do a developer's 10 minutes of work. Uh, it took me about two weeks, but I made the first prototype for the cache effector. If you don't know what that is, go check out Ernst University cache effector. It allows you to cache the values of uh, clones into an effector and do all sorts of great things. So, and, Noseman, before... Yeah. Before mm -hmm. I and other people start to panic, yeah. is this part of the certification at all? Well, this is the main thing. We, the only, we're going to ask you to create... Um, <laughs> your, I'm joking. No, no. This is not part. But again... I don't uh, want to do it. <laughs> what, I, what I'm doing here... So, you know, if you want to go on a long and interesting journey, uh, it's good to say, yeah, I'm going to go, I don't know, to New Jersey, right? But if you aim at the moon or the stars you're going to be more inspired to take a more adventurous journey. So that that's sort of my my concept here. Nothing, n none of these, there's not going to be any formula effectors and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I advise everyone to aim high and learn more because the more you try to learn, even if you don't reach your goal, you will be led down very interesting roads. You're going to have um, a great uh, aha moments like, oh my God, I didn't know I can do this. So, I like to point quite higher than what the requirement is because I understand everyone is busy. Uh, and as humans, you know, we try to to um, conserve energy. So I want uh, I want to inspire people to aim higher than they feel is necessary so that they can reach the goals which are better than the ones they thought they can achieve. So that's why this is not part of the certification, nothing at all. This just is a reply to someone that, ask the uh, question uh, to just show. Maybe we can have a future ask the trainer on it, uh, perhaps, because in the comments, it sounds like it's a topic that people would be interested about. Yeah, we can bring. We have some amazing people uh, within our inner circle of uh, Maxon that are um, th th very, very good at this, like Andy Needham and, and all sorts of other people that have actually, they use it for projects and so forth. So just ask the questions out there, you know, go on social media, uh, ask questions on, on Twitter and whatnot, ask the, the Maxon trainers, uh, send emails and, and all that, because the more we know what you want to learn, the more we can focus our uh, presentations in, in that direction. And remember, there are, not, there are no uh, stupid questions, all right? There can be some stupid answers, but there are no stupid questions. Every single thing. There, I don't think there was any single question I've been asked uh, in my life, and I've been supporting people, not only 3D, 
I've been doing support since the mid 80s. All right. Uh, that's a long time ago. Most of you were not even born. Maybe <laughs> your parents were not born, but that's a different story. So always ask your questions. You have no idea what can come up from a question that sounds simplistic or seems uh, irrelevant and, and so forth. What else? No, that's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Also, I did the wrong email before. So you can email us at, we've got a special Ask the Trainer email now. So it's ask the trainer at maxon.net. Um, or as Noseman was saying, you know, Twitter, Instagram, any kind of socials, YouTube comments. We try our best to, to answer those as well as much as we can. If we don't answer, um, well, we, we may be ignoring you, but that's not the case time, right? <laughs> so, no, if we don't answer, for some reason, the message didn't, didn't come through. We actually want people to ask questions. It makes our lives easier, right? It's much easier to have a specific thing that someone needs uh, to, to be shown rather than us trying to figure out, oh, I wonder what they want to see now. So you are driving this this whole thing. So yeah, um, just ask your questions and hang out and share, you know, uh, share and whatever, follow, uh, subscribe, like, and all that nice stuff. Smash that button. Smash that button and the ring. Bell. Absolutely, yeah. That is that's so great. Yeah. So we should probably wrap up. We we overrun. A little bit, but you know, we wouldn't be the Max on training team if we didn't overrun, right? So, That's tradition. yeah, it's, it's bad luck. If we if we finish on time, the words go, the world is going to end. So, you have been warned. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So once again, thanks to thank you, Noseman, for this incredible kind of ninety minutes on such such like a deep dive into MoGraph. There were so many positive comments in the chat, just saying how much they enjoyed it, as much as getting their questions answered live as well you know that's that's such an important thing with these like ask the trainer sessions and thank you to um sassy michelle darren answering questions in the background as well and also to hashi who is helping us run this whole kind of youtube live as well i have one last thing to say if someone's you know. not satisfied please post a comment because yeah people you know are polite and all that uh, if someone didn't like it please say i didn't like it right i mean because you know it's uh, you always need a, a bit of a, a negative right i want people to downvote some of my videos to uh, give me perspective <laughs> and then we know how to make it better then for everyone don't exactly. we like, exactly. that's and that's all we want to do make sure these are, are as good as possible for you guys to to learn as much as you can so as always it's been a pleasure to be on here with you guys and to see everyone live and um yeah i guess we'll we'll wrap it up now and we'll catch you on one of the next sessions whether it's ask the trainer hands on with max on vfx and chill all the other stuff that we're doing as a training team and have a wonderful rest of your week everybody bye, -bye everyone bye everyone